conversation with Gautam Nolaka on uh, India, the war within. Gautam is a well-known human rights activist from India. He has been for very long associated with People's Union for Democratic Rights. Uh, he has written widely on democratic rights and human rights and civil liberties in the context of India. So he has been <clears throat> one of the very few people who have been an outspoken critic of the government in terms of the intervention in Kashmir, in the Northeast, and uh, recently he traveled into the heart of India, which we want to talk about today, where the Indian government has launched a war. Now this is not reported very much in the media, so we don't know that the Indian government has put more than 70 to 80,000 paramilitary and they are basically trying to encircle a region right in the heart of India and a, a, a pretty much a war is going on by the Indian government against its own people. So we want to understand why this war is going on. And Gautam traveled to that region along with John Middle and he spent a lot of time there. He interviewed the General Secretary of the Communist Party of India, Maoist, and he wrote a detailed travelogue of what he found there. What kind of society is emerging there? What are the issues that people are getting organized uh, on? Uh, what are the emerging structures of alternative power? So we would like to hear from him what is going on there, what is the context, and uh, what kind of alternative politics is being fashioned there. Now, but before I ask Gautam to come and speak to us, I will briefly set the context of this whole thing by uh, talking briefly about some macroeconomics issues in, in, in the context of India. So I will briefly try to address this question whether uh, the growth that is taking place in India and about which we always hear a lot. So take out any business uh, newspaper and you will you'll hear about the fascinating growth that is going on in India. So what is the impact of that growth on the working people of India? Is it improving their lives? So that is the kind of issue I would like to uh, talk about by showing you some very striking evidence and that possibly will set the context to understand why the Indian government has launched a war on its own people since about 2005. And we will try to understand the various stages that the war has taken place. So first, there was a formation of a vigilante group which was supported by the state. That didn't work and then the paramilitary has come in and as I said, in the press it was reported that 70,000 plus paramilitary is there. Now even the uh, Air Force has come in, so initially the Air Force was uh, just helping with reconnaissance but now they are also trying to engage. There have been reports that the military is also possibly going to be engaged. So it is something which, which is really serious and which we want to try to understand. So let me briefly talk about this microeconomic context by showing you some evidence of growth and distribution that's going on in India today. So what I would like to really ask you to consider is these three aspects of the growth regime that is currently underway in India. One is that this growth process is increasing inequality across various lines. So across lines of class, caste, region, inequality is increasing. The main reason why inequality is increasing, according to my view, is two things. One, there is stagnation in agriculture, and agriculture still employs the largest portion of the Indian workforce. So the second thing is that whenever they try to go out of agriculture, what is available is employment in the informal sector, which is very low uh, wage paying and uh, jobs. So both these things imply that a huge number of the workforce is caught in this low productivity, low wage work. So therefore, this in inequality increasing implies that this growth process is really bypassing the majority of the people. The other thing which is a, which is a implication of this is that income and non-income measures of poverty have not improved at all. If anything, various things have worsened. 
So therefore, that is one of the important things to keep in mind to juxtapose against this discourse of growth that is going on. And the third important thing is that the current phase of growth has managed to put a huge attack on the basic resources that the poor use, which are usually common property resources or resources outside the domain of the market and trying to push them out of there. So these things have led to the resistance of people against this forced dispossession and exclusion. And that is basically the context where various kinds of political movements have emerged and one of them is this movement by the CPI Maoists and the state has launched a war on that. So that is basically what I will try to argue. But let me show you some graphs. So this is what the business press always talks about, the growth rate. And it is true, it cannot be denied that if we want to measure the progress of India in terms of GDP, the growth rates have increased. So you can see this starts in 1951 and there is a striking trend that the growth has increased. That is true and this is precisely what people are focusing on with the implicit assumption that this growth must be leading to an improvement of the condition of the people. Now that is what is not happening. And the main way in which we can understand that is by looking at what is happening to employment. So this is a very striking figure. This shows the growth rate of employment in the formal sector of the Indian economy. So to understand what we mean by formal and informal, in India there is these two kinds of jobs. Formal sector jobs come in with social security, high wages. There are various kinds of rights that workers have. And then there is employment in the informal sector, which are very small firms, which do not have regular employment, wages are very low, conditions of work are hazardous, there is no security of jobs, so you can be fired any time. What this is showing is that in the period in which Indian economy has been growing at a very high speed, the total organized employment growth has been close to zero. Now look at this period, 83 to 94. That was the period one when this neoliberal growth regime was being put in place. At that time, the growth in the organized sector, employment was about 1.2%. That's the green line. That is still below the, the growth of the population. So even during this period, population was growing much faster than total organized employment growth. Now look at the next period, 94 to 2008, when the economy has really taken off in terms of growth rate of GDP. And you see that the green line has basically collapsed to zero. So employment in the organized sector has not been generated during this huge period. Interestingly, this whole thing is being led by the, the state cutting back. And the state generation of employment in the state sector has become negative. Now when I showed this earlier, Gautam pointed out a very important fact that even though the total employment growth of the state has gone down, there are sectors of the state where employment is positive. And you can understand that if you understand that the war is taking place. So employment of the military, employment of the paramilitary and the police, that is growing. So some kind of jobs are being cut, but some kinds of jobs are growing. But overall, total organized sector employment growth has been close to zero. So what does this mean? This means that all these people who are joining the workforce during this period are being pushed into the informal sector. According to a report of the Sen Gupta Commission, which was formed to study the uh, unorganized sector, close to 94% of the workforce in 2004-05 was employed in the informal sector. Informal sector jobs, as I said, is marked by low wages, very hazardous conditions of work, there is no job security, uh, there is no social security, you don't have the rights to organize. So this is where most of the working people are and therefore it is not surprising that this whole growth process is bypassing the largest section of the working people. Now this informal sector is spread across the sector. So if we want to look at agriculture, industry and services, so it's not surprising that most of the agricultural employment is informal. 
what is surprising is that even industry and services, large pro proportion, more than 70% of employment is of an informal nature. Now, <clears throat> that really sets the tone to understand that the growth process that is going on today is not built on any structural transformation of the US Indian economy. So if the, there is no structural transformation, that raises a huge question mark on the sustainability of this growth. Now one way to understand this lack of structural transformation is look to look at the sectoral composition. So the first figure gives us the sectoral shares of these three large sectors, agriculture, industry and services in terms of employment. The second one gives the share of these three sectors in terms of value added to national income. What is striking is that the share of value added from agriculture has fallen precipitously from about 55% to currently about 15 or 14%. But employment has not fallen all that much. Currently the Indian agriculture still employs about 55% of the population. So that, ref that really highlights the fact that no structural transformation is taking place and a large proportion of the workforce is still in agriculture where productivity is low and there is stagnation. And what is available outside agriculture is informal sector employment, which we have seen is the only kind of employment that has been generated during this period of high growth. So this has naturally, so this you can skip, this has naturally led to the, the fact that measures of poverty which are meaningful have not improved over time. So this is a very striking figure. What this shows on the left hand side is the proportion of the poor, where the proportion of poor is measured as the number of households who spend less than the poverty line. Now focus for one minute on what this poverty line is. In 2004-05 in rural areas, the poverty line was 357 rupees per capita per month. So anybody who spent more than 357 rupees in a rural scenario in India in 2004-05 would not be counted as poor. In urban areas that is a little higher, but what I am trying to suggest is that the poverty lines are abysmally low. These are very small numbers. Now if we just look at the people who are falling below this poverty line, of course the proportion has fallen a little. So that is the blue line on the left extreme. That has fallen from about 30% to about 20%. So this is what people who think that this current phase of economic growth is beneficial to the poor always harp on this, that the poverty ratio of people <laughs> under the poverty line has fallen. But if you want a more realistic measure of poverty, we should increase the poverty line to a more realistic number. So one thing which this Sengupta Commission did was to suggest that anybody who spends less than twice the poverty line should be considered as economically vulnerable and poor. Now if we do that, that is the green line. So if we count everybody who spends less than twice the poverty line and just focus on the fact that the poverty line is just 357 rupees per month. Now this expenditure includes everything, food, non-food items including durables, health expenditure, transportation, uh, taxes, rents, all these things included, 357 rupees. So increase it to twice that amount. <laughs> if we consider everything spending less than that, less than to be poor, then you can see that the green line has not really gone down. 80% of the population were poor by this measure in 1994. In 2004, it is only about 77%. Can I take the questions once okay. I finish? Okay, sure. Or if you have a clarification. I'm just curious if, you know, when you say poverty, it, it would be different in cities than uh, in rural, I would assume, because rural people would grow the crops, on, you know, a lot of people would grow crops on their property you know, to feed themselves. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, how much that would be. And, and in the cities, it would cost more to, to sustain yourself because you're not doing that in cost of cities or more expensive. Right. right. 
So this actually takes account of some of that. So.